Effectively, the Rockefellers have used the cause of global warming as an alarmist message and shared cause designed to unite the world around their globalist agenda, despite the fact that the family's fortune has historically been bound up in Exxon Mobil, the flagship institution of Big Oil. What was coined Big Oil was based around the existence of Exxon Mobil, which is largely responsible for the phenomenon in the first place. As revealed by Alexander King in the first global revolution, a report from the Club of Rome said in 1993 the following, quote, The common enemy of humanity is man. In searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with this idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine and the like would fit the bill. All these dangers are caused by human intervention, and it is only through changed attitudes and behaviour that they can be overcome. The real enemy, then, is humanity itself. End quote. The Rockefellers are, of course, the preeminent globalists and founders of its leading institutions like the Bilderberg Group, the Council on Foreign Relations, and the Trilateral Commission. And the Rockefeller Foundation has long worked as a front for CIA covert operations. In his 2002 autobiography, Memoirs, David Rockefeller confessed the goal that he and those within his network have actually pursued. Quote, For more than a century, ideological extremists at either end of the political spectrum have seized upon well-publicised incidents, such as my encounter with Castro, to attack the Rockefeller family for the inordinate influence they claim we wield over American political and economic institutions. Some even believe we are part of a secret cabal, working against the best interests of the United States, characterising my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I am proud of it. End quote. John D. Rockefeller Sr. was tasked by the Rothschilds through their agents John Jacob Astor and Jacob Schiff, to gain control of the American oil industry, deciding that America would not join any scheme for world government without a change in public opinion. Colehouse and members of the Inquiry and the Roundtable formed the Royal Institute for International Affairs, RIIA, in 1920, for the purpose of coordinating British and American efforts. They also formed an American branch known as the Council on Foreign Af uh, Relations, CFR, founded in following year by Colehouse and Walter Lippmann with the financial assistance of John D. Rockefeller Jr. The early CFR included members like J.P. Morgan and Sabbateans like Paul Warburg and Jacob Schiff. As reported by Charles Higham, in trading with the enemy, the Rockefellers' standard oil was part of a network of cooperations and banks, which he referred to as the, quote, fraternity, who were largely responsible for financing the rise of the Third Reich, interestingly. Many of them, like Averill Harriman and the Bush family, were involved in the Yale Secret Society of Skull and Bones. Since 1927, Max Wahlberg served on the board of directors of IG Farben, which his brother Paul served on the board of directors of the company's wholly owned American subsidiary, which was also associated with Standard Oil. And if you don't know what um, IG Farben was, IG Farben during the Third Reich was the pharmaceutical company which made Cyclone B for the concentration camps during the Third Reich. While continuing, the Club of Rome grew out of a 1965 international conference called the, quote, Conditions of World Order in Italy, which was owned by the Rockefeller Foundation again, of course, and which was sponsored by the CIA Front, the Congress of Cultural Freedom, referred to as CCF, with a grant from the Ford Foundation and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. The founders of the Club of Rome were all senior officials of NATO. These included Aurelio Pecchi, the chairman of Fiat, who was also chairman of the Economic Committee of Atlantic Institute, and Alexander King, the co-founder, who was 
Director General of Scientific Affairs of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. In late October 1968, only half a year after the founding meeting of the Club of Rome, the OECD, in collaboration with the Rockefeller Foundation, held a quote, working symposium on long-range forecasting and planning, end quote. From 1956 to 1960, the Friends of the Earth, referred to as FOE, fund financed a study conceived by its then president Nelson Rockefeller to analyze the challenges facing the United States. Henry Kissinger was recruited to direct the project. Seven panels were constituted that looked at issues including military strategy, foreign policy, international economic strategy, governmental reorganization, and the nuclear arms race. The Club of Rome raised considerable public attention with its report, Limits to Growth, written in 1972, which sold 12 million copies in more than 30 translations. So it it was a massive contribution to the climate agenda, making it the best selling environmental book in world history. The Club of Rome helps coordinate an international network of environmental agencies, whose ultimate purpose is to use the movement to promote New Age ideas as the worship of, quote, Mother Nature, you know, Gaia, or an idea rooted in neo-paganism fundamentally. Marilyn Ferguson, uh, author of the 1980 bestseller The Aquarian Conspiracy, referred to this network, which in addition to environmental groups also includes things like peace groups, human rights groups and groups fighting hunger, or more modern, in a more modern scenario today, you've got things like Extinction Rebellion, and all of these kind of movements were fundamentally influenced by the kind of foundation of the Aquarian Conspiracy and the New Age ideas that came from it in relation to climate change by people like Marilyn Ferguson. Interestingly enough, to quote Pecky as saying, as they represent, quote, the yeast of change, saying in relation to these movements, the yeast of change scattered myriad spontaneous groups of people springing up here and there like antibodies in a sick organism, end quote. It's quite interesting to look at the kind of ways in which these people reference the world and how they see the world externally through their own lens, because you do start to see a kind of sense of high level of biological disgust in some sense, where they're constantly using analogies of the world being a sick organism that needs to be treated, that needs to be uh, medically fixed or something like this. Ferguson was a protege of Willis Harmon, Willis Harmon's protege and also a director of IONS, uh, named after the concept of no sphere developed by Pierre Tilliard de Chardin, which was responsible for conducting MK Ultra experiments on behalf of the Stanford Research Institute uh, in a CIA sponsored project known as Operation Stargate. But uh, IONS uh, was founded in 1973, which is the Institute of Noetic Sciences by Edgar Mitchell, the sixth astronaut to walk on the moon who claimed to have undergone a cosmic consciousness experience on his return flight to Earth. Mitchell founded IONS to encourage and conduct research on human potentials. IONS plays a central role in, you know, something like Dan Brown's Lost Symbol book, which is about Freemasonry. Mitchell established this institute together with ex-Nazi and NASA rocket scientist Fernher von Braun, and billionaire investor Paul Nathaniel Temple, a former Standard Oil executive. Temple was a major funder of both uh, the Institute of Nomadic Sciences and Veriday's The Fellowship through his Three Swallows Foundation. But in May 1974, Harmon had led a SRI study titled Changing Images of Man. The report was prepared by a team that included Margaret Mead, B.F. Skinner, the famous psychologist, Irvin Laszlo and Sir Geoffrey Vickers of British Intelligence. Others included in this project included the famous Carl Rogers, who was a psychologist, James Fadiman, Ralph Mentzer, and of course the very famous Joseph Campbell, 
The stated aim of the study was to change the image of mankind from that of industrial progress to one of, quote, spiritualism. The report interestingly enough stressed the importance of the United States in promoting Masonic ideas, effectively creating what you could refer to as the ideal Masonic state. And if you were to progress, you know, mankind into an image of spiritualism, would it really be specifically isolated towards the imagery and symbolism of masonry? I wouldn't think so, but this is what it states. In Global Mind Change, the promise of the 21st century, a book sponsored by IONS, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, Harmon remarked that, quote, we are living through one of the most fundamental shifts in history, a change in the actual belief system of Western society. No economic, political, or military power can compare with the power of a change of mind. By deliberately changing their images of reality, people are changing the world, end quote. The answer he posited was a reconsideration of the empiricism of modern Western societies and a return to the marriage between science and mysticism that was exemplified in Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry. According to Harmon, quote, the essential premise of Freemasonry was that there are transcendental realms of reality in which we coexist, and of which we potentially can have conscious knowledge. While the patterns and forces of these realms are inaccessible to the physical senses, they are available for exploration through looking into the deep mind. They play important roles in shaping evolutionary and human events, and can be called upon for power and guidance." End quote. So this is their supposed explanation of why a vision based around the image and symbolism of Freemasonry for the new Western civilization would be of an ideal state for them through their communications. Harmon believed that the uh, symbol of the pyramid with the floating capstone on the Great Seal quote, indicates that the nation will flourish only as its leaders are guided by supraconscious intuition, end quote, which he defined as quote, divine insight. The phrase novus order seclorum, meaning a, quote, new order of the ages, indicates the birth of not just another nation, but of a new spiritually based new world order. According to Harmon, quote, the power of these symbols on the collective psyche is such, however, that if the American nation is to regain its earlier position of moral leadership in the world, it will be through an effort focused around these symbols and meanings, and no other. End quote. In regards to the ever-growing non-profit industrial complex, artist Hiroyuki Hamada explained the situation eloquently when he wrote the following. What's infuriating about manipulations by non-profit industrial complex or non-industrial complexes is that they harvest goodwill of the people, especially young people. They target those who are not given skills and knowledge to truly think for themselves by institutions which are designed to serve the ruling class. Capitalism operates systematically and structurally like a cage to raise uh, domesticated animals. Those organisations and their projects which operate under false slogans of humanity in order to prop up the hierarchy of money and violence uh, are fast becoming some of the most crucial elements of the invisible cage of corporatism, colonialism, and militarism, end quote. Both the Rockefeller Family Fund and Wallace Global Fund provide substantial financial support to Earthrights International ERI in their lawsuit against Suncor and ExxonMobil. The largest direct descendant of John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company, of course. So it's all very strange and um, Rockefeller being invested in oil for many, many, many years, which is how they became so, you know, important and influential, then investing in other non-profits to go against other things they used to be invested in for many, many years. And this takes us back to thinking about what their premise is in some sense. They were the founders of, quote, big oil thus making them responsible for their own globalist climate agenda, which will give them more power, as it is for them the process of making a certain reality inevitable. In a sense, they have committed 
themselves to the idea that we have to kind of, let's say, destroy the world to a marginal degree to own it, to have the ability to then own it. Uh, because it is a self-fulfilling prophecy, because it will be the only option left, if you will. To have complete control, we have to at least make it look like there are no alternatives left than climate, or climate activism, or climate agenda, or, you know, basing the economy, and the all the kind of different industries that we have in society based around one specific uh, intention, which is climate based change or climate agenda. With that idea on board, then they just simply transfer their economic capital into things that were not of the past by using the non-profit industrial complex.